while filming, the cameraman kept saying, hold it, one more shot, hold it. I was keeping the helicopter steady as best as I could and slowed down a lot. It was taking too long and suddenly... Welcome aboard, High Flyers! This is Fly High with Carola Pilote. I'm a commercial helicopter pilot and flight instructor. As usual, for simplicity, I'll refer to Robinson piston helicopters during this presentation, since most of our students learn to fly these. We're going to start with a story based on a real-life experience as a newly qualified commercial pilot. It was one of my first aerial filming missions, and I was thrilled because I absolutely love this kind of work. The combination of flight techniques and teamwork with a cameraman is something I really enjoy. I spent a lot of time preparing, ensuring everything was within limits and that the plan was solid. We were filming in a stunning area in France, the Jura Mountains. It's a beautiful location with lakes, rivers, waterfalls, picturesque villages, mountains and cliffs. It was a beautiful summer's day. We had planned to take off early before it got too hot and it's better for these type of missions but the crew arrived late and setting up their equipment took longer than expected. By 10 a.m. we finally took off and we had exactly one hour to complete the mission. Everything was going smoothly. Usually I avoid hovering out of ground effect which requires significantly more engine power. I prefer to fly at a speed of 30 to 40 knots for static shots to limit the power required. This is a safe speed, slow enough for the cameramen, and the guys were quite happy with that. I kept an eye on the clock and saw that we had to be heading back. As you know, when you're a commercial pilot, every minute counts. On our way back, we passed this magnificent waterfall and we all agreed on capturing one last perfect shot. We had to get it right on the first take as there was no time for a second pass. While filming, the cameraman kept saying, hold it, one more shot, hold it. I was keeping the helicopter steady as best as I could and slowed down a lot. It was taking too long and suddenly... Fortunately, I aborted the shot and I'm here today to share the story. Our main objectives today are to understand what RPM is, recognize the importance of RPM, learn what happens when RPM is too high or too low, avoid unintentional RPM changes, and know what to do when things go wrong. RPM, or revolutions per minute, measures rotation frequency. It's essential in helicopters for both engine and rotor performance. The Robinson R22 tachometer is very visual. It shows two values. On the left is engine RPM, and on the right is rotor RPM. The engine RPM is higher than the rotors, so both are displayed as percentages to keep the values visually aligned for easier monitoring. Here's what you need to know about the RPM ranges. With power on, the RPM ranges between 101 and 104%. With power off, during auto rotation, the rotor RPM ranges from 90 to 110%. So you can see, for normal operations, the helicopter's RPM is within that small green zone, which has incredibly tight margins for error. Staying within the zone ensures sufficient lift. If you'd like to learn more, join our online ground school, where dreams take flight. And speaking of lift, remember this? Hmm, it's the lift equation. The coefficient of lift, CL, is related to the shape of the rotor blade and the angle of attack. While we can't change the blade shape, we can control the angle of attack by adjusting the collective to change the pitch of the blades. The next factor is S, representing the surface area of the blades and the rotor disc. Normally the surface remains stable as the blades don't change in length or width, however, RPM gross weight and g-forces can affect the surface area of your rotor disc. Low RPM, high gross weight and excessive g-forces can increase the coning angle, that is the upward bend of the blades, 
which in turn reduces the effective surface area. By maintaining proper RPM, managing weight and flying smoothly, we can indirectly control the coning angle. Next up is half row, with row representing air density. Denser air improves performance, and though we can't control it, it's essential to understand the factors that affect it. Atmospheric pressure, temperature, humidity, and altitude will influence the air density. For denser air and better performance, we prefer higher atmospheric pressure, lower temperatures, lower humidity levels, and lower altitudes. Finally, we have velocity squared, which refers to the rotor blades as they spin through the air or airflow over the blades. This is directly related to the RPM of the rotor. Because the velocity is squared in the equation, any change in the RPM has an exponential effect on lift. For example, doubling rotor RPM quadruples lift, while halving it reduces lift to only a quarter. Now, as we saw earlier, reducing velocity or RPM also impacts the coning angle and the surface area. It can lead to increased angle of attack by the sinking of the helicopter and the upward rushing air, this can be made even worse by raising the collective and can lead to a stall. This is why velocity or RPM is the most critical factor in the lift equation. Maintaining a steady RPM ensures optimal performance and safety throughout the flight. There are three primary methods for maintaining stable RPM. You can adjust the throttle manually, the correlator is a mechanical link between the collective and the throttle, adjusting power automatically as the collective is raised or lowered. This system is quite effective, but still requires fine tuning. For that, we have the governor. It's an electronic device that senses rotor and engine RPM, automatically adjusting throttle to keep the RPM constant. The governor is active between 80 and 112%. While effective, it's still important to practice manual control in case of governor malfunction. A malfunctioning governor can cause erratic RPM control, either overspeeding or underspeeding. Symptoms include RPM fluctuations without automatic correction from a governor that has simply stopped working, or the throttle twisting and RPM fluctuations without pilot input. In the event of a governor failure, grip the throttle firmly, turn the governor off, and complete the flight using manual throttle control. RPM fluctuations can also be attributed to pilot error. Some common mistakes are starting the engine with a throttle open, confusing left and right throttle movements, especially if you're a biker, because it's the opposite to that of a motorbike, gripping the throttle too tightly and overriding the governor, accidentally turning off the governor, mishandling RPM during auto rotation, especially upon entry when loading the rotor disc, and requiring more power than is available. Be very wary of this when flying in high, hot and or heavy conditions. Also, be aware that the governor is less efficient at high altitudes and requires smooth pilot inputs to keep up. An engine overspeed can lead to severe damage, including misalignment of the fan wheel, easily spotted during post and pre-flight checks, scoring of the cylinders, damage to push rods, piston seals, and the crankshaft, as well as magneto damage. Overspeeding the rotor can lead to excessive blade stress, bearing damage in the blade spindles, deterioration of the drive shaft, as well as damage to the main and tail rotor gearboxes. These repairs are costly, but more importantly, they can compromise the safety of your flight. Low rotor RPM is dangerous regardless of the helicopter's airspeed. As we saw earlier, it can lead to a reduced surface area, an increased angle of attack, and a potential rotor stall. Robinson Safety Notices 10 and 24 explain this really well. To assist with monitoring rotor RPM, a warning light and horn will activate if the RPM drops below 97%. In the event of this warning, the correct procedure is to immediately lower the collective, increase 
throttle and apply aft cyclic if you're in forward flight. Here are some real life examples. It's interesting to observe the parameters when they're available and to see and hear how the helicopter responds to low RPM. Buckle up, let's dive in. In this example, focus on the sound of the alarm, the rotor and the engine, plus the unusual vibrations at the beginning of the video. It's only towards the end when the helicopter approaches the ground that we get a brief view of the cockpit. We can see the altitude is approximately 2,700 feet with the airspeed indicator showing 60 knots and manifold pressure at around 25 inches. The RPM dropped alarmingly low, below 70%. According to Robinson, rotor stall can occur at 80% RPM plus 1% for every 1,000 feet of altitude. <laughs> I'm confident this accident could have been avoided with the correct recovery maneuver. Unfortunately, in this case, the instruments are not visible. It appears to be a warm day and it's possible the helicopter was overweight, though we can't confirm this due to lack of information. The alarm sounded shortly after takeoff. Paused for a few seconds. then resumed. There is no sign of an attempted recovery maneuver. In this example, the altitude is approximately 2,000 feet with manifold pressure from 25 to 26 inches and the airspeed at 100 knots. The RPM drops to roughly 8% and the rate of descent increases sharply to 2,000 feet per minute accompanied by excessive vibrations. The RPM was recovered just in time during the approach to land by applying aft cyclic and then lowering the collective, therefore lowering the manifold pressure. This is the case of an attempted landing on a mountain at 5,000 feet. The helicopter was close to the ground and in a near hover, which requires more power. The low RPM alarm came on when the collective was raised for more manifold pressure. Instead of forcing the landing, the decision to abort was made. The collective lowered and the RPM was successfully recovered. I hope you now have a solid understanding of RPM and why it's crucial for your survival. This video will also be available on our French and Spanish channels. Remember, RPM is life. Fly safe and see you soon on Fly High.